uh, from Boston at springtime. So happy spring, but I know many of you are um, zooming in from elsewhere in the world and perhaps other seasons as well. Um, we are joined today by Sandra Waddock, um, who will be speaking with Andy Hoffman on um, several. Uh oh. So, Erica, I just lost you. I lost Erica as well. Same here. Okay. I'm still here. I okay. showed up again. I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to rapidly turn this over to Sandra, but just a couple quick announcements. We will be recording this and it will be available on the EMA website shortly. So you're welcome to pick it up there as well. We will also be moderating discussion through the chat. So feel free to put any questions, comments, remarks, resources in the chat, and we will save the chat as well and can make that available. Um, I'll also post some things in the chat for everyone. Again, we welcome you warmly. We would love to have you at any or all EMA events. Um, we have a rich calendar of events and I'll put some more information in the chat. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra, who's the Galligan Chair of Strategy at Boston College. And again, welcome to the Intellectual Shaman Discussion Forum. Thanks, Erica, and uh, welcome to all of you, and welcome to Andy. Um, so as you know, the uh, Intellectual Shamans Forum really focuses on issues of faculty development. And um, today's uh, talk, and we hope you're going to engage with us in this talk later on, um, is very much uh, uh, apropos to that topic. As you know, um, what I call intellectual shamans, and Andy was one of the people profiled in the book in the book by that title. Um, they are healers, connectors, and sense makers in the service of a better world. Well, Andy is one of the, he is probably the only person I know to have had two books come out in one day. And he's gonna talk to us about one and I might ask him about the other if, if I get a chance. But one of them, is, I'm gonna put it up here, is called The Engaged Scholar. And that came out the very same day as the other one which is called Management as a Calling. Um, and he's gonna to talk to us today about the engaged scholar. But let me introduce him quickly here. Andy uh, Hoffman is the wholesome U US professor of sustainable enterprise at the University of Michigan. He holds joint appointments in the Ross School of Business and the School for Environment and Sustainability. And he's a real pioneer in the whole business and sustainability arena. Um, he's written more than 100 articles and book chapters and has published 16 books, two of which came out on the same day this year. Um, and he's received numerous awards for his work. Um, his work focuses on using org organizational behavior models and theories to understand cultural institutional aspects of environmental issues for organizations, particularly around issues of climate change. Um, but he's also written books on purpose um, and climate skepticism and, of course, engaged scholarship, um, which is what he's going to be talking about today. And an important book with John Ehrenfeld a few years back called Flourishing. And... If you're interested, he, one of my favorite books ever is his autobiographical book called Builder's Apprentice, which talks about his early life before he became a professor, um, which I highly recommend if, if you're interested in how young people um, begin to find purpose. So um, we can talk about some of those things later if you're interested. And please do put your questions and comments into the chat, which Erica and I will try to monitor. And he's going to speak to us about what he means by engaged scholarship for maybe 20, 25 minutes. And then um, I'll ask him a few questions and then hopefully there'll be some questions from you. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Andy, and mute myself. Okay, well, thanks, Sandra. And thank you all for being here. Um, Sandra asked me to talk for 15 to 20 minutes um, about what the book is about. And rather than get into slides and things like that, what I thought I'd do is, you know, I was trying to figure out what I was gonna say and I, I thought I'd read the preface and it's 2,300 words. Um, I looked it up and the National Center for Voice and Speech says the average conversation rate for English speakers in the United States is about 150 words per minute. So I should be able to get this done in 15 minutes. But I think what it'll do is give you a sense of what I'm trying to do with the book and also my writing style. And um, before I do that, I just wanna point out, I deliberately chose Stanford Briefs as the platform for doing this. I, I really like that business model um, they're designed to be short, punchy, 
and they're cheap. And this book is, um, is 133 pages long. It's got 28 pages of citations. Uh, it only costs $14 and there is a discount code, uh, Hoffman20, that will get you 20% off. So it's $11. And I deliberately chose this platform, as I said, my hope is that it will get picked up for doctoral seminars to start to teach doctoral students about the idea of adding this dimension to their identity as a professor, as a scholar. I think it's desperately needed. And, um, and, and so I'm trying to provoke a conversation. It's a short book, so it's not gonna answer all the questions, but it's gonna touch on the different themes that I think are important, both in terms of the world we live in today and the rules by which we presently live and how those rules need to change. So we can start to think about how professors, scholars, academics can be more of a part of the discourse in our world today. So, but I thought I'll read the preface 15 minutes or so, and then I'll turn it back to Sandra, if that's okay. Um, so let me begin. Opening question in the book, why did you choose to become a professor? When I feel myself losing track of the purpose or meaning behind my work, I return to this simple question. And my answer is equally simple. I want my research, teaching, and outreach to have a positive imprint on the world around me. Citation counts, A-level publications, and an H-index pale in comparison to that simple outcome. Yet, our reward systems elevate these metrics, and they don't come close to capturing my deeper purpose. So that, that leaves it to me to decide what is valuable and important in my academic pursuits. I know that that kind of independence is hard to assert, especially when you are early in your academic career. But as you advance, you'll find more freedom to exercise your independence. For me, I keep in mind the challenge from Jane Lubchenco, who's a marine ecologist at Oregon State and former president of the AAAS. And she argued that academic scholars must abide by what she called scientist social contract, that they have an obligation to provide a service to society, to give value for the money provided by public funding, government grants, and tuition revenue. It's an obligation that is born out of both a societal need for the expertise that academics possess and a recognition of the responsibilities that come with the privileged life that academics lead. I'm writing this book at a particularly precarious time. The COVID-19 pandemic is wreaking havoc on our lives and our livelihoods. People are suffering and society needs answers. Yet many people are turning away from science, distrusting its conclusions and its motivations, and even questioning its assessment that the virus is real. This is happening because we are now immersed in an array of confusing and conflicting messages that question facts, blur the line between opinion and fact, and dismiss formally respected sources of information as merely political interest pushing a partisan agenda. These are not my words. This comes from the RAND Corporation, a study they did called Truth Decay, and they describe this as the existential crisis of our time. If we do not improve the scientific literacy of our public and political discourse, how can we make sense of the challenging issues that we face? You can't set policy or make informed decisions about nanotech, stem cell research, nuclear power, climate change, vaccines and autism, genetically modified organisms, endocrine disruption, gun violence, or COVID-19, if you do not agree on a common set of facts to ground the conversation. To my mind, this existential crisis lays the gauntlet at the door of the academy. If academic scholars do not provide the kind of scientifically grounded knowledge that society needs, who will? But the societal crisis is happening at a time when the academy itself is facing a crisis. Academic research is becoming increasingly irrelevant as the work becomes too insular, the language too opaque, the journals too inaccessible, and the cultural norms of disciplinary boundaries too balkanized. We need to break out of our siloed research communities and bring our work to a world that needs it. In the war words of former University of Texas at Austin President Larry Faulkner, the antidote to irrelevance is engagement of the university with the real needs and aspirations of the supporting society. Now, not every academic must take on this role, but this book is a call to make that path more acceptable and legitimate for those that do, to enlarge the tent, to be inclusive of multiple ways that one enacts the role of academic scholar in today's world. Some may prefer to impact the world of scholarship, but others may wish to have more impact in the world of practice. 
bringing their insights and knowledge to directly solving the great challenges of our time. While both are needed, unfortunately, the academic reward system steers people only towards the former. This very book that you're holding, or that if you were holding when you're reading it, will not register highly in my annual review because it's not on quote unquote academic. A-level publications are the coin of the realm, but if you wanna have impact in the real world, you must take your work beyond the academic publications and bring it to the world of practice. Let me offer an illustration. Um, before COVID, I was, at, I was speaking at a conference and I asked the attendees to raise their hand if they were concerned about climate change. Everyone did, it was a group of scholars on sustainability. I asked how many devoted their research to this topic? Most kept their hands up. I asked how many aimed that research at A-level academic publications? All hands remained raised. I asked how many felt that another A-level academic publication would change how society addressed the issue of climate change? Most hands came down. This is the strange irony in which we find ourselves, and it is an irony that some have begun to question. A new generation of scholars is emerging into the field with a strong desire to make a difference in the real world. This book is for them in particular. Whether they are new PhD students entering, just entering their degree programs, young professors just starting their careers, or mid-career professors who have begun to question the purpose behind their work, my hope is to inspire a career path rooted in rigorous, rigorous research, but expanded with the goal of relevant impact on practice within society. Even seasoned professors uh, may find some value in these pages. It's never too late to consider the measure of your life's work based on meaning and purpose instead of status, however defined. This book will not summarize the entire field of public engagement. While it offers some coverage of the field, it will chiefly focus on the posture and spirit for adopting engagement as part of the academic portfolio. At times, it may stride into the domain of polemic, and I will add parenthetically, it does. But overall, it will be about amending the types of questions we ask in order to blend rigor and relevance. We're redirecting what we do with the answers to bring them to the attention of those who need them and recreating the institutional structures for supporting and accelerating changes in how we create and disseminate research. And it will be about offering hope. I have talked with many PhD students who entered their program with a desire to have real world impact, make a difference, improve society. But after just a couple of years, they feel pushed into a corner and toward disillusionment. I don't want them to let the spark die. I want them to hold a vision of their career that strides towards the elusive pastor quadrant, which I talk about in the book if you haven't read it. Public engagement <clears throat> has been the goal throughout my academic career. I study environmental issues because I care about preserving and protecting a natural world. I earned a joint PhD degree between the schools of business and engineering and was held to that goal by a committee of advisors that included business school professors who kept asking about the theoretical rigor of my work and engineering professors who keep asking, what's the point? For me, the point is that I wanna see the impact of my work and the thoughts, values, and behaviors either that I reach in of those that I reach in business, policy, and society. My work stands on the shoulders of the social theorists that came before me, but I use that theoretical knowledge to understand and change the empirical world and not setting a priority to use the empirical world to contribute to theory within the academic literature. And as I have advanced in my career, the balance of my portfolio slowly shifted its emphasis from academic to public audiences. I still write academic papers, but I write more books intended to span academic and lay audiences. I take my work to more public audiences through practic practitioner journals, web essays, radio interviews, and talks at business, government, and nonprofit conferences. I even speak at high school students, senior citizens, local community groups. I feel like I am fulfilling my purpose when someone approaches me after one of my talks to say, I changed the way they thought about an issue or an executive tells me that I provided tools that can help them in their job today. I feel the same feeling when my books appear in syllabi around the world or assigned as some, or acquired summer reading for incoming freshmen. Twice I've invited to give a freshman convocation address and the satisfaction I feel in reaching those young minds far exceeds anything I've ever felt in reaching my academic peers in the seminar room. In the end, these, academic, these activities define the role of academic for me. 
and I wanna encourage other scholars to do the same when the occasion presents itself. I am a tenured full professor. That means I can do anything I want. I do not intend to cease academic work, but this stage of my career is an opportunity to branch out into domains where I can have real world impact. Why don't more senior faculty use the opportunity to experiment? In the words of one of my colleagues, a problem with our field is that we have too many senior professors thinking like junior professors. They chase the same publication counts they did as junior professors because it feels safe. In the words of University of Michigan President Mark Schlissel, quote unquote, we forget the privileges to have lifelong security of employment at a spectacular university. And I don't think we use it for its intended purpose. I think the faculty on average through the generations are becoming a bit too careerist and staying inside our comfort zones. But if we're perceived as being an ivory tower and talking to one another and being proud of our discoveries and our awards and our accomplishments and the letters after our name, I think in the long run, the enterprise is gonna suffer in society's eyes and our potential for impact will diminish. The willingness of society to support us will decrease. Now I've seen some senior professors who upon reaching retirement become embittered because their work was not fully recognized by the world. But I wonder what those professors had done to make the work, world, the work known by the world. Did they write articles in academic journals and think they had contributed to public discourse? For the most part, neither the general public, nor lawmakers, nor business people read them. People will not search out our work in academic journals. We must bring it to them. Other interests are beating us to the punch, publishing their own reports, often with a political agenda, and using social media to have far more impact on public opinion. Add to this changing landscape, a rise in pseudoscientific journals, and we must face the reality that if we continue to write only for specialized scholarly journals, we become relegated further to the sidelines. As professors, we have an opportunity, indeed an obligation, to bring our work to the world. I once heard it proposed that professors should, upon receiving promotion to full professor, be required to write a book that pulls together the 15 to 20 years of their research and aggregates it to a cohesive whole, a book aimed at a lay audience. What an experience that would be. It would both terrify professors and change the view that they hold for their work and its purpose. The role of full professor is a rare and wonderful gift. Should we not use that gift to make a real and lasting difference in the world? Should we not learn new skills and models for how to play a new role and see our careers in the long arc that leads to that possibility? The seeds for that possibility must be planted early. One cannot shunt all interest engagement aside for the 15 to 20 years it takes to get a PhD, tenure and promotion of full professor and then expect to suddenly reignite the passion. We must cultivate that passion while recognizing the expectations and demands of the institution in which we live and work. Then when we are ready, we will have found the voice to contribute to society at a time when society most certainly needs us. Now more than ever, we need engaged scholars who can bring their expertise to the world, informing public and political discourses on the great challenges of our day. For this to, need, need, for this to happen, we need a more socially literate scientific community to engage a more scientifically literate public. We need scientists who can be effective communicators of what science does, how it does it, what it tells us, and what it means. We need scholars who can take complex ideas and interest issues and make them understandable to all demographics, young and old, poor and affluent, liberal and conservative. I hope this book stirs enough scholars to begin or to affirm their journey towards their goal, that goal, and in so doing, make a difference in the world. And that's my preface. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sandra. Okay, Andy, I'm overwhelmed um, at the thought of us having to do all of this. And, and so particularly for the younger scholars, I mean, you and I are lucky enough to be in chairs and to have done this, but how do we gain the kinds of skills that you're talking about when what we're being called to do is write these academic papers filled with jargon so that we get our impact factors up there and our citation counts up there? How do we get these skills? You know, this is such an important question. I, I um, organized a, a conference on this in 2015, and it was a Michigan meeting, and the deans all had to approve it. And they had two suggestions that I thought was really interesting. Um, one, 
can you create a handbook for scholars on how to do this? Two, can you create a handbook for administrators on how to create an environment in which this can be done? And there's the challenge. The problem is that the senior professors, many of us don't know how to do this. And in fact, the landscape is changing so rapidly, no one knows how to do it. But you, there are, there is work out there being done on this. Um, people are trying to figure it out. There are, there's a whole section on the book on, I, the book is broken into five chapters. The first is the crisis of relevance. And, and, and we're facing that. The second, the limitations of the existing reward system. And if you really think about it, I mean, our impact factors, if you really think about what they mean, they don't mean much. And there's some startling statistic. The average paper is cited 10 times. 80% um, of humanity articles never cited. 30% of social science articles never cited. And yet we can get tenure for this. Something's amiss. The third chapter is rules of engagement. And there's a lot of work being developed on this of how do you do this? A lot of social science. I have some issues with that. I'm on a committee with the National Academy of Sciences on the science of science communication. And I'm a little bit of a fly in the ointment because I say, at the end of the day, this isn't a science. To be a good communicator, you have to be accessible, authentic, open. And I, I make a, a, a snide remark in the book. I say, it's, it's like sitting down with your partner and work out a, an issue with your relationship. And you say, I got these flow charts here. I pulled out of my academic paper on how we can work out our, our differences. Your partner would rightly jam that piece of paper down your throat and walk out of the room. So how do we help people? You know, um, Boston University hired acting coaches to try and teach their, their academics how to be better communicators. Alan Alda contributed to the Center on Science Communication at Stony Brook. How to be storytellers. Um, our last National Academies Conference on Engagement, how to be a storyteller. The fourth chapter is um, how do we use social media? And this is somewhere that senior professors just are lost. And social media is so important for where we go. And I open with a simple question. I'm, when I got my PhD, and I'm, I'm looking at a lot of the faces on the screen, I bet they'll resonate. I went to the library, I found an article, I went up to the stacks, I pulled a book down. I went to the Xerox machine, I copied it. I looked at the bibliography, I found another article and went back to the stacks. Today, we go to Google Scholar. How many of you know how Google Scholar works? If your paper in a search doesn't show up on that first page, forget it, no one's gonna find it. And in fact, if it doesn't show up in the first three, well, odds are they're not gonna find it. Do you know how Google Scholar works? No, no one does, because it's proprietary. And how many people know that Scopus, Web of Science, Google Scholar, you can do an H index on any one of those, they're gonna come out different. They have a different algorithm. We ignore social media at our peril. And so I talk a lot about social media and how it's used, how it can be used. Um, there are all kinds of circuit, search algorithms, search uh, optimization things you can do. All metrics is out there trying to figure out different kinds of metrics. It's in its infancy, but it will get developed and it will be as good as what we now do with H index and citation counts, which is pretty crude and rough too. And then the final one, the final chapter is really trying to think about your career in the long arc. I never thought about what to be as a full professor until I became a full professor. And even then it took like a year or two for me to really sort of catch on. And if we could start to get students to think, okay, where, what kind of person will you be through the arc of your career? And how do you think about the stages in your career so you can anticipate and plan for what you're gonna do when you're given the opportunity to do it. So there's the arc of the book. So the long and the short answer to your question, we still have to figure it out, but we need to, we need to learn and we need to teach it. And, uh, and I would also add that if we don't teach our doctoral students, a lot of them are doing it themselves. There's a group of students here at Michigan that started its own program called Relate. And like, fine, if you don't wanna teach us, we'll teach ourselves. And they're doing things like, uh, you know, teaching you how to talk to uh, government officials, how to give government testimony. I was fortunate I went to the Leopold Leadership Fellowship Program and they taught me a lot of these things, how to use social media. And I was a resistor when it started. So there are ways to augment your education. We need to bring it deeper into our training program. And that's my hope of this book is it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a wedge to get into those doctoral seminars, the junior faculty seminars, as a starting point, as a point of conversation. I hope the book pisses some people off. I think that second chapter will. Um, but something I've learned 
when I've written about climate change and I get hate mail, um, a quote to get you through is, if you're not offending anybody, you never took a stand. And so if I said something good in this book, I'm going to get some people angry at me. Let's see what happens. So, so you know, your comments remind me, um, I was, when I think about what it means to be a full professor, I talk about fully professing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I don't see you having just started that when you became a full professor. You have done this all your life. You have been interested in topics that no one else was interested in and been willing to pursue them and taken the risks associated with that. So for our, our younger colleagues here, I mean, and you've succeeded despite yourself, maybe. Um, it, yeah, um, despite the, the system that we're embedded in. Um, you have done this. You have fully professed about sustainability. You've taken on topics like climate skepticism. You've taken on topics like purpose. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's what I called in, in the Intellectual Shams book, a risky, a crooked path. Um, you, you know, although you've been at... Um, Michigan for a very long time, it's not its not necessarily been easy for you. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Well, you know, I, I was lucky to begin with. Um, I started studying a topic just as it was about to begin. I mean, I was interested in environmental issues in the early 90s. Business school professors wouldn't touch it. I struggled to get a committee together. And now those same business professors the sustainability in their area of expertise. Um, I also went into academia, and I mean this in all sincerity, with a, a, a deep, profound sense of ambivalence. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an academic. I really backed into it, and I can tell that story if you want, but I really got kind of backed into it. And I never really set out to be an academic. I never set out to have an H index or citation counts or anything like that. It was never even on my mind. And, and if I didn't get tenure, I knew I could get a job elsewhere. I, I, I really did. And I would have been pissed, of course, but I would have moved on. And I've watched some people come up for tenure and they become a wreck because all their eggs are in this basket. And if they don't get tenure, they're ruined. And it's awful to watch. Worse yet to watch them not get tenure. I've seen some people get, not get tenure and, and their life just, just fell apart. And, and I really was ambivalent. And that, that didn't manifest itself in courage. It, I would say it manifests itself in a certain naivete. I just, I was doing what I wanted to do, not realizing anything unusual about it. This is what I wanted to do. Um, I do think that I went through a joint PhD program that was less constricting. And I do see um, a lot of PhD programs I see that that really put shackles on students. I mean, for goodness sake, PhD students are coming out now with A-level publications already put to bed before they go on the market. That terrifies me. I mean, it really, it really, we're creating students who are great technicians. I worry that we're not creating thoughtful, creative, curious, exploratory risk-taking people. We're, we're really teaching them to be very conservative, that, that your, your worth is measured by your, your, your citation counts and your A-level hits. And, you know, and we've all done it. How many times have you said, oh, he has five ASQs. Wow, he must be smart. What are they about? I have no idea, but he has five ASQs. I mean, it just, it's the world we live in. And so I never fully bought into that. And, and again, I was lucky. I think if I came out today, I wouldn't have had the same success. I was lucky to do it at a time when this was a brand new topic. I mean, I got introduced to a talk like almost like eight years ago as a grandfather of the field. <laughs> that, just, that just shows you how young the field is and how lucky I was that I came in. If I was 10 years earlier or 10 years later, I would have missed the wave. Yeah, you know, um, y- y- you say lucky. Um... I, I and the people I, I interviewed twenty eight people for this book, all of whom are extremely well known, and I think almost all of them. I put this in the chat actually. Claim to be lucky, so it's it. it yeah, there's some luck involved um, in my own career. Certainly, there's been luck involved, but there's there's something else here 
that goes to this sense uh, that you've written about in another book that I actually used in a course for a while um, called Purpose. And it's got and it's got to do with purpose. So uh, before we turn it over to some, we've got some great questions in the chat, and please continue to put, put them in. So before we turn it over to the um, participants, and I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask Andy your question when it's your turn. Um, um, can you talk about purpose a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, it, the idea of a purpose or a vocation is something very important to me. And, and you're right, Sandra, I mean, I, in my work, I've connected to something that's bigger than me. And that, that gets me up out of bed in the morning when Donald Trump pulls out of the Paris Accord. I still get out of bed. I didn't want to, to be honest with you, I didn't. Um, but it, 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 the work has not been about me. It's, it's been about the issue. It's been about the calling. And, and, and that, that makes all the difference to my mind. And I really am trying to push that idea with my students figure out your calling, your vocation. I've recently been asked to create a program on how to help business students find their calling in management consistent with the book. And I've thought about, I'm still working on it. I don't know exactly how I'm gonna do it yet, but one thing I have come up with is that if I do this right, I'll know it worked. I'll de I know I got it right when some students leave business. If they really find their calling, I can guarantee you everyone in this call right now can think of students that really don't belong in the business school. Um, they're chasing the money, the status, they're chasing the beautiful building. Ross has a big, beautiful building. It's a big, shiny bauble that draws students in. I want to be in that building. What do they do? I don't know, but I want to be in that building. And, um, and so how do we instill that in others? We need to do that. And so, so the idea of a purpose, the idea of a vocation, the idea of a calling um, is really central. And that requires time to slow down. It, the, the theme in the engaged scholar in, in many ways is the same as the theme in management as a calling. Focus on your own intrinsic motivations, your own intrinsic rewards. Don't totally buy in. We have to recognize we live in a world, there are extrinsic rewards. I mean, even when you become a full professor, some people say, do anything you want. No, you know, you, it doesn't mean that, you know, it, and my annual review will get me a 2% raise. Woohoo, big deal. But we're also social creatures. And I, I, would, I, I would struggle to, to, to have my peers shun me. That would be hard. And so we, we do recognize the extrinsic, but, but don't only focus on the extrinsic. Analyze, discern is a word I use, discern your purpose. There's a wonderful essay by Herbert Shepard where he asks, um, are you a cormorant? And his, his, his analogy is a cormorant is a bird that's really good at catching fish. So the fisherman puts a band around his neck and a rope around his foot and throws it in the water. The bird comes back with the fish, the fisherman takes it, throws it back in the water. All day, the bird does what it's really good at, but he does it for somebody else's purpose. Now, are you a cormorant? Are you doing something you're really good at? Are you chasing something, the H index, the citation counts? Because trust me, there's no end to that because someone's always gonna have a better H index. Someone's always gonna have higher citation counts. You will never fully feel satisfied. And so look inside yourself. What are you trying to do with your career, with your life? And, and if you can do that, hopefully you can develop some of that ambivalence to the point where if you don't get tenure, maybe you would be better off in a think tank or a nonprofit or someplace else or industry or government. Um, don't just chase tenure because that's what I'm supposed to get. It would hurt to lose it, of course, but what are you doing with your life? You got one life. And I do believe on those final moments in that final deathbed, you're gonna look back and you're not gonna be measuring your worth by your H index or citation counts, you just aren't. You're gonna look at how you touched others, how you maybe left the world a little better than you found it in whatever way you choose, whether it's your students or your speaking or your writing, whatever it may be, how did you fulfill your calling? Thanks. Um, I'm going to, uh, Mike Barnett, are you still here? You had a, a question early on. I am. I'm sitting outside in the middle of a windstorm. Wait, wait, can, I, can I mute you for one second? I, I don't think I could quite. 
Well, I only came here to ask for uh, really best practices on beard grooming. Um, yeah, awesome. yeah. I, I give a private tutorial later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I'm wondering about is, you know, have you just given up on the notion of engaged scholarship being careerist or being in your own self-interest as opposed to having to kind of come at the expense of it? Can we ever align that? I'm trying to tease out your question. I mean, can you use engaged scholarship to advance your own career? Well, yeah. I mean, why is it that we can't affect the system itself and make it actually care about engaged scholarship if we think it's valuable? I don't think that's your expense. Yeah, but I don't think that's careers. I think what Mark Schlissel was talking about being careers is just chasing the external validation of the metrics, you know, he, he says that if we're impressed by the letters after our name and the and the awards and all the all the nonsense, all the static, if that becomes our primary motivation, then we're becoming careerist. Yeah, no, I get that. I'm just saying, you know, can't journals at the A levels want this stuff, right? So that you don't have to give up on that in order to pursue. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, RRBM is trying to make that happen. Um, can journals produce, uh, top journals produce more work that is of uh, topical issues? But, and I would add this, that that's, and that, you know, that's something I benefited from is that I was writing academic papers that were easily translatable to the general public. They did care about those answers. If I was doing work on just standard HR management practices, that would be a little harder, but you still have to do that extra step. You don't just stop with that academic paper. There was a study by Princeton. No, not Princeton. It was at Penn, uh, a number of, like three years ago. They calculated the average cost of an A-level management publication. The answer was $400,000. If the only purpose of that publication is a line on your resume so you can get a job at a great university, I would question whether that's really a good use of that money. But if you can take that work and then bring it to the conversation to NPR to I don't care where, but bring it out into the world because the world is not going to come to you to find it. There's the extra piece. The careerist would say, I got my A-level publication. I got my bump this year. I'm going to move on to the next academic publication so that I can go to the Academy of Management, thump my chest, and everyone will say, what a great guy this is. When in fact, you get outside academia and people are like, who the hell is that? You know, so that's that's the careerist element that I think he's talking about, because the, the rest of that quote, he was he was really riffing on the idea that, you know, people are just focusing on very safe questions. And there are numerous people. Um, there's a, a Nobel laureate in chemistry. What's his name? Oh, I can look it up real fast. Um, he. Yeah, Randy Sheckman. And he has announced that his, he is no longer going to publish in what he calls the vanity journals, Nature, Cell, and Science, because he says those journals narrow the domain of what's considered legitimate research. Um, I got a chance one time to talk to Paul Krugman, and I asked him, the work you got the Nobel Prize for was all in B journals. Why would you do that? And he said, because the A's wouldn't take it. That says a lot. The A's have a very narrow sense of what is legitimate research. and you know, they have a theory fetish. We need to change that. So can the journals change? Yes. Will they change? I hope so. I hope so too. And, you know, I, I get frustrated whenever I try to submit a paper because I've been doing all this work on transformation of late. And, you know, they make you force, they force you to try to pick keywords from their list of keywords. And nothing that I'm doing is in their list of keywords. And so it's like, talk about a narrowing of the way we think about um, the kinds of work we should and, and the journals have become careerist in their own way. I mean, how many of you gotten reviews back saying we're going to move forward with this paper, but we need to cite you to cite more papers from our journal. And then what they do is they put it on the web for a year or two, and then they publish it. Why do they do that? The impact factor starts counting at the date of publication. They're beefing up the citations to beef up their impact factor. And that's how, how convoluted and confused our system has become. And I think that, that we are so fixated on these little narrow domains that um, the rest of the world is saying, where are you guys? You know, Nicholas Kristof had some editorial in the New York Times saying, professors, we need you. And, and, and they do. 
Um, Nancy Curlin, you've been incredibly active in the chat. I wonder if you want to not don't don't take up the rest of the time, but um, maybe give us a perspective that Andy can respond to. Oh, I was just I'm I was just providing a lot of information about uh, how to measure uh, uh, engaged scholarship at for tenure and promotion. Um, Andy, I, I said in the chat a few years ago, you had a session at the academy that I happened to attend and you inspired me. I took lots of notes and they sat on my home desk for, for several years. And then my college got this large uh, million dollar grant to start a center for sustained engagement. And so I was lucky enough to be a faculty co-director. And so you've really inspired me. And I've been doing a lot of research on how to evaluate. And we're getting this into our promotion and tenure criteria now. So my one question, actually, because I read your book and I wrote up a little book review, which I'm hoping I can get published soon. Um, but one question I do have is there, there's an assumption in your book that there's that um, the scholar is a one way sort of the sage going out to the community. And the way I think of engaged scholarship is it's much more of a collaborative process where you're actually working with the community partner to create knowledge together. Oh, if, if that came across in the book, I need, to, I need to make that clear that's not the case. I did try and point out one thing that academic suffers is, is the, the model of academic engagement called the knowledge deficit model. That I go out to the public, their brains are half full. I'm gonna pull my knowledge into their brains. They'll think like me and they'll make good decisions. And um, maybe the students in your classroom bought that contract. I don't believe that works in the classroom either. Um, people on the outside did not buy that contract. Um, uh, I can tell you in, in, in Ann Arbor, a lot of people who are not connected to the university are careful about inviting academics to dinner because they don't want to get lectured. And when you hear, and I'm sure you've heard it, when colleagues say things in, in normal conversation, they'll say, well, the literature says, now imagine if you're not an academic and you hear that. What you've heard basically is what I'm about to say is sacrosanct, it's gospel. Do not question it because the literature says this. So shut the hell up and I'm gonna give you some, some of my knowledge. That's basically what that says. And people start to shut down. The idea of measuring impact is a very interesting question. And, and I wanna look more at what, what you put in here because a lot of schools are trying to figure this out. No one knows how to do it yet. And there was a very interesting survey of scholars in the UK. And it was a whole series of questions on just life in academia. And on the questions on engagement, a lot of the scholars skipped those questions. And then there was one question, how do you measure impact? And those that answered it, a large number of them said, please don't. We do this because we want to do this. We do this because it's important to us. And if you put a metric on it, people will chase the metric and you'll ruin it. Don't ruin it. I have some sympathy with that, but then again, if you wanna change academia, you've gotta change the rewards. And they're both formal and informal. We have the formal rewards, but citation counts. We also have the informal rewards and, and it's, it's colloquially referred to as the Sagan effect, the Carl Sagan effect that if you engage with the public, you're either not good enough to do academic research or you're not a serious academic, um, when I went to grad school, uh, the dean at Sloan was uh, Lester Thoreau, very well-respected economist. Then he started to write some trade books, and his peers started calling him Les Thoreau, just for doing that. Even when he died, like three years ago, his obituary in the New York Times still mentioned this. Like, for goodness sake, let it go. And so that is a problem. That it, 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 It's deep. It, you change the rewards, you still got to change the culture. At the University of Michigan, I'm on a committee for the president. How do we get more people to do this? So they did the same thing against my objections. Let's have an award dinner. Well, guess what? Some of the people that were really doing it, they didn't want to come to an award dinner. They didn't want to call it out. They didn't want to put a magnifying glass on themselves. They do this because they want to. And, and so it's a very tricky, difficult thing, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see what you wrote in the chat on, on, on how you do this, because it's, it's not easy. Uh, Matthew Lee, are you still here? You had a question around the broker. Yeah. yeah, sure. So, so it's totally related to what Nancy was just asking about. And, you know, I'm coming at this thinking, OK, if it's partly about inspiration and partly about incentives, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my late 30s now. I started, I entered my PhD program at, at uh, 24, and I could have totally stolen your words, Andy, of 
you know, I wanted to make a positive imprint on the world around me. And I've also been really lucky and I've tried to sort of bridge these things while also doing what I needed to, to check the, the career boxes. Um, uh, but but I and now I'm working with doctoral students and for them, I don't think there's any lack of inspiration. I think it's all about, it's all about the rewards. Um, so on that point, I'll just read my question quickly. So uh, re regarding the broken academic reward system, my understanding is that we arrived at this set of incentives that we have because this set of incentives solves a problem of commensuration. So I think if you went around and asked a bunch of people, is the number of A-level journal articles uh, published the right way to measure quality, everyone would say, absolutely not. But it's the one that we can all agree is at least good, is correlated with quality. And so that's the one we have because we have to have something that we all agree on. So what alternative system do you propose? And, and maybe more relevant, how do you propose we try to reach agreement on a shared conception of, to just borrow your words, relevant impact on practice within society? Are there other professions that have done so successfully that we can learn from? And finally, it would be great if you could solve this problem before my tenure review. <laughs> yeah, I can answer that in five minutes. <laughs> You know, one of the challenges with this question, I think, is that the solution has to be institutional. Um, one school could say, we've got a new set of criteria for tenure, and we're going to value this metric. It, you as a junior scholar would be crazy to chase it unless they were going to guarantee you tenure because you still need a, a, a saleable packet in the market. And so if you if you create something totally idiosyncratic, you've just killed your career chances if you don't get tenure and talk about elevating the pressure there. And so as I see it, there's a lot of experiments happening at different areas. Uh, the Mayo Clinic has added social media to its tenure and review process. The ASA has also come up with a proposal on how to do that. Here at Ross, we have added a fourth criteria to an annual review called practice. Um, which also raises some interesting questions that we should be asking in other areas. So they said practice, because you can have impact in multiple domains. So this is impacting people in practice. Then it raises interesting questions. Then what is the research piece? Well, if it's just the audience, then this book is an academic book. I don't think of it as an academic book. It's not academic research, but the audience is academics. Is that the research category? And do we, do we create our categories based on audience, practice, professionals, research, academics, teaching, students, engagement, our community? Um, so there are a lot of experiments out there. There are some schools that are now starting to allow tenure candidates to write an impact statement. There are some schools that are allowing you to get letters from people in practice to say, you know, Matthew Lee had an impact on what we do at uh, Ford Motor Company or or something like that. Um, you need people on that committee who know how to evaluate that. Let's face it, if your tenure committee is just people that know how to crank out A-level publications, they're not gonna be able to know how to evaluate this. Um, we need to change, you know, ACSB is starting to look at this in their accreditation process in terms of impact. Um, we need to, you know, change the journals, our RBMs trying to change that. So I think, to create institutional change, you have to hit it in all the fronts. And there are different elements hitting those fronts, but to put it in business school parlance, I think of it, you know, like the, the innovation S curve. And we're right at the beginning of the curve. Will it die and be stillborn? It could be. Will it grow to a point where we'll start to hit that steep part of the curve? I do think that can happen. And if it happens, it will happen fast. What happened before you come up for tenure? I would advise you not to plan on it, but I would also advise you if you do care about having impact, don't put it off until you get tenure. You will lose some of that spark, that energy, that passion, that purpose. So phase it in slowly. Don't get rid of it altogether. You have to recognize the reality of the world you're in. I hope that helps because um, I'm just, I'm just, you know, when I first started doing this, I was thinking, that's my goal, Matthew. I'm going to change the institutions of academia. And I quickly started to realize I'm, I'm Don Quixote. I'm tilting it. This is too big. But then I realized one way I'm making a difference is by doing this and not killing my career. And other people are looking going, oh, you can do this without destroying your career. It is possible. 
And so if that's my little piece in this of a broader institutional change, that's what I'll do. But I will try and nudge the institutions when I have a chance and I'm able. Um, and we can all do that. And I do think that there's a younger generation coming in that really cares about this. I mean, when I got my PhD, if a doctoral student announced they didn't want to go into academia, there's a high likelihood your advisors would quit your committee. Why would I bother? My job is to procreate, to spread my minions over the world. That's, that's why I advise students. That's why I put this time into it. I think that there are so many now that would say that and do say that, that if they were jettisoned, we would just decimate the ranks of future, future scholars, the generation of scholars. So strength in numbers, a younger generation coming in, a time when they're needed, um, that, that, that RAND Corporation study, Truth Decay, just really, to my mind, just, just nails it that we are that community that is no longer respected. We need to get that back. And we're not going to get it back by publishing another article in ASQ. So, Andy, um, you know, I was told early on in my career not to do the work I was doing, which was about then about public-private partnerships um, and uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, Sunitha, are you here? You had a comment, and I, w I was wondering if you wanted Andy to respond to it, if you could just state it. Thank you, Sandra. No, uh, for me, I think as I'm listening, I'm pretty inspired by what's being said, but at least I'm, I'm from India. The ground reality is you have no publication, you don't even get a job. So, and then, for me, it seems, uh, I mean, to, like two different worlds or, you know, it's easier to say after you've reached a certain stature. So what about people like us who really need a job? I mean, that's where it's, it seems a little paradoxical for me. Well, I'm not saying don't do research. I'm saying not saying not, not publish. I, I think that we are, at the end of the day, scholars in a world and the academic publishing can can establish some rigor to what we do. What I am saying is take the next step, change your publication strategy. So for example, you publish an article, you, what have you spent like four or five years getting this article out? And I'll say to people, write an essay for the conversation, sum it up. And I say, I don't have time to do that. I'm like, give me a break. You just spent four years writing an article and you can't spend an afternoon summarizing it in 700 words, give me a break. And then it goes out. And I've had this happen and then NPR picks it up or something like that. Then also, as you start to advance in your career, this obsession we have with A journals, um, it drives me crazy when I talk to a junior faculty member saying, you know, we're working on a paper. I really think it fits in this journal. I can't publish there. It's not on our list at our school. What is that? Um, so as you start to gain the security, then you can start to think about, okay, I got this paper. Where does it fit best? It's not always the A journal. And I hate the A, B journal model. It creates a hierarchy. And I think the A journals is much more theoretically driven. The B journals is much more empirically driven. Different audiences, different purpose. And sometimes a faster outcome. Um, I've, had some, I've had desk accepts at B journals. I hate the term. Maybe it should go into a blog. I think about the Harvard Business model. You submit something to Harvard Business Publishing now. And they will look at it, and they will shunt it. Oh, that goes to the book division, that goes to HBR, that goes to Ascend, that goes to our blog. Do that with your own career. And as you start to advance, you can always chase the A-level publications. It may take four or five years to come out. First of all, that's called guaranteed irrelevance. Or you may have that paper and say, maybe it goes better in this other type of journal. It comes out in one year, you've written your blog, it's been in NPR, you're on to the next paper, when the other paper was still trying to get out of the block. Why? Because that other paper fits with the extrinsic rewards and the other one may fit with the intrinsic rewards. So I'm not saying give up publishing. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but change your publication strategy over the arc of your career. Keep focused on what you're trying to do with your work and try and always strive towards that, to that kind of impact. I hope that helps. Mike Barnett had a comment that I agree with and, and that's, um, I've just lost it, <laughs> but um, it, it's really got to do with publishing rigorous research 
Um, mm-hmm. So as long as we're doing that, I always uh, tell doctoral students who are concerned about, oh, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. You know, do good work, do a lot of it. You I know. would add one more thing, because if all we do, if the only time we can think we can speak on a topic is if we have a paper on it, then, we're, then we've been muted. And I think about it that you have spent all this time developing this expertise. You look at the world through a certain lens. You have something to say about the world based on that lens. Sometimes you can just talk. Because again, the time it takes for a paper to come out, papers are being developed right now on COVID. Trust me, they're gonna come out well after this is over, they're gonna be useless. But does someone in this room right now have something to say about COVID? Absolutely. Through what channel, what platform will they say it? There's the question, there's the interesting question. I think about it, there was a certain point in my career when I started to feel like I had voice. I had something to say given the lens I used. When you hear Jeffrey Sachs speak, he may not use jargon, but you know he's looking at things as an economist and that gives him a rigor, a structure, a model to give some really grounded observations on the world around us. I think we should do that more, but all we care about is the latest paper. And I often think about the difference between an academic and an intellectual. And this is where I may piss people off, but an academic can talk about the latest papers. An intellectual can talk about the world. I remember the first time I met Mayor Zald. It was amazing. I mean, he was talking about what was on the cover of the New York Times that day through his lens on social movements and the depth and and the, the, the wisdom which is all too lacking in what we do, wisdom. We create knowledge, but do we create wisdom? That's a totally different thing. And we need to take that extra step as we become full professors. I feel like I'm starting to rant, which I often do on this, but in many ways, I feel like I'm saying the emperor has no clothes. And I hope it feels that way. And if it doesn't, I have to say it harder. So Andy, I was gonna ask, cause somebody raised the question, Rich DeJordi raised the question about, um, yeah, uh, 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 the difference between an academic and an intellectual, and and you sort of just went to that, or a public intellectual. Yeah, if, you know, as public last... intellectual gets a lot of people exercised. They, yeah, they, they feel that you know. But there's a right. There's a book I like. Historians again, academic historians, they attack it. But the last intellectuals by Jacoby, and his point is the last great intellectuals were in the mid-century, and most of them were disconnected from universities. They were serious, rigorous critics of the world around us. William White, um, Upton Sinclair, uh, even Rachel Carson did not have an academic appointment. And yet they wrote important work that was really connected to the issues that we were facing. And his point is that the academy has ruined that because we've created these narrow channels for what we should do of what's considered knowledge and um i'm sympathetic to his argument and that will piss people off too thank you so much um there are about a zillion more questions but unfortunately our hour is up so i just want to thank everyone i want to thank you andy for giving us this incredible perspective and i and you know i know how passionate you are about it because i've heard you speak about it and um and i agree with just about everything you're saying um so i hope that some people in our audience can take away some lessons that are helpful here and um erica do you have any final words final words are really keep well much gratitude sandra to you andy to you um, to all of these faces that I'm so happy to see joining us from around the world. Um, continue to tune in with EMA, the International Humanistic Management Association, for many more such events moving forward. Um, and again, many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Good. Well, everybody. Thanks, thanks Andy. Andy. Thanks,